Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Barbara. <sighs> Was it Diane that asked me? Thank you. I'll get back at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my sobriety date is August 16th, 1992, and my home group is the West Portland group, up in Portland, obviously. And uh, my husband and I came down here to watch his little brother play baseball for the Dodgers, and he got uh, traded. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> <laughs> And my husband said, we might as well, you know, we're going to AA meetings, so we might as well be there and hear our favorite speakers. (laughs) So, (laughs) just kidding, just kidding. Um, What it was like, what happened, what it's like now, in in a nutshell, um, I hit my bottom uh, right over on Camrose, right by the Hollywood Bowl, um, 15 years ago, almost exactly 15 years ago. my entire life I had felt very much on the outside and uh, very uncomfortable in my own skin, um, just really um, miserable, even if I had success, even if people praised me, even if I felt, you know, like I was in the right place. Uh, I just could not fit into the world. And when I was 16, my mother had gotten rid of my alcoholic father, and she felt like she had finally found the solution to getting some peace within our family. And then she took me to a wedding reception, and there was a couple of really popular kids there. And I had had a lot of sips of alcohol. You, you can't grow up around an alcoholic and not at least try a sip. But that had not been a sufficient amount to get into my system and, and do the magic. And at this reception, this guy, his name was Dennis, he pushed this beer across the table. And, you know, I was upset because the bride was getting a lot of attention. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was just kind of a wallflower, and I thought, I'm here, you know. Um, But at the same time, there's that bravado, and then there's that feeling of, you know, don't look at me, I'm not worthy. You know, just, I'm such a, you know, less than. And so my mom was across the room, and it it never occurred to me to say, no, thank you, even though I had seen all just a lot of sadness and wreckage in my family of origin. I just took that beer, and it was instinctual, and I just slugged it down, probably a third of it, and I I physically felt it first, um, but I drank a little bit more, and I believe this is what makes me alcoholic. The room was a hostile place where I was not good enough, and and yet I was, you know, deserved more attention, and I, I drank alcohol. I got a sufficient amount in me. I looked up and the room had changed completely. I was completely comfortable. I mean completely, and I'd only had maybe half a beer. But I weighed 128 pounds, and I was 16 years old. And um, and I'll tell you something, my mother can move when she wants to, and she was across that room and on me, and she tore me out of that wedding reception, threw me in our little Honda, and drove home. And that uh, summer breeze was the best breeze I'd ever felt. And she told me to go to my room. I was in trouble, which I isolate, so, oh, God, you know, that's not punishment. And I put on my little headphones on my stereo, and I listened to the Cars, uh, a song called Moving in Stereo. And it moved from side to side. Now, that's no big deal now, but that was a big deal then. And I'd been listening to that song for a long time, and it was magic. And I just laid there, and I, all I could think was, this is going to happen again. This will happen again. And from that moment on, no exaggeration, every waking moment I pursued drinking because I had gone from someone who could not function in the world, who always felt like everyone else had all the information. I had gone from just being completely on the outside. All of a sudden, I had the solution of how to actually take a full breath how to settle into my skin, and and I felt a part of something. And it's interesting because 
all of my buddies that I had hung around with prior to that turns out were all alcoholic, and none of us had even, and, you know, hadn't even really drank yet. But I intuitively knew, you know, who to connect to. And then we had that one poor little Al-Anon, you know, that drove us and you know, <laughs> held my hair back when I vomited. And, you know, those good friends. Um, and so, you know, I pursued my drinking um, as best I could. I never really looked old enough, but I had a boyfriend who had a mustache and beard, and you know, and I didn't really like him. The nose and everything. Not there's anything wrong with the nose. He was not attractive, but he could buy alcohol, so that's why I stuck with that boyfriend. And uh, <laughs> I went to college, and you know, my my alcoholism progressed. Um, I would say slowly. I got sober when I was 28, so I only drank for 12 years. But um, when I went to college, I actually met my husband, Chris, and. His alcoholism progressed very quickly, and in contrast to mine, I thought, now that guy needs to quit drinking. You know, he was, <laughs> had a problem, and, and that's what I often did. I, I surrounded myself with, you know, he wasn't a lower companion, but he was a harder drinker, and his disease was further along, and he was a blackout drunk, and my drinking was just a lot of vomiting, a lot of patheticness, a lot of values thrown aside, a lot of dreams um, unrealized, and just a lot of um, kind of volatility. I'm a person that has a really bad temper, and I don't like being told no. I don't like the way you drive. I don't like the way you look at me. I have a lot of opinions, and um, <laughs> so when I drink, you know, everything's like butter. And it's not a problem. It's just smooth. Life is very, very comfortable. Um, I graduated college, and I realized that um, the problem was Oregon wouldn't you? And I had been born in Northern California. I'm, an Oregon, I'm a California girl, I thought, so I moved to Southern California. My goal was to become mayor of San Diego. I hate politics, <laughs> and I got a degree in elementary education, so I have no idea what I was thinking. But I thought, you know, I was always trying to figure out what will complete me, because the reality is, is that I could not stay drunk 24-7. And so there was big chunks of dryness in between the rewards. And I'm one of those alcoholics that really strive to pay my bills, to suit up and show up, to, you know, to show up to work. Um, I'm like the opposite. I'm just, uh, just this extreme. I, I'm willing to die for my look good. I want you to perceive me as an earth person, as a successful, normal person. And um, so I came down here, and I had dated that guy in the front row there in college, and briefly, and I told him never to come around when he was drunk, and he came by one night, and I said, told you not to come around when you're drunk, he's like, I'm always drunk, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite kind of guy, um, but I promised myself I wouldn't end up with, like, a, a man like my father, and my dad's an alcoholic, and that was one of my promises, that I would not become like my father, and I would not marry my father, I became my father, technically I married my father. <laughs> creepy. Um, <laughs> don't go anywhere with that one. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I spent five years down here in Southern California, and I took a life that was full of promise, and um, I, I dove it hard into the dirt. I just blew it up, and I ended up with this long-haired loser who I was supporting and took more time in the bathroom than me, and it was just, it was an ugly, ugly <laughs> life, and he was in the industry, you know, and, and he just thought he was all that, and I'm like, hey. anyway, he did B-movies, and he was a loser, and um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with B-movies. You can say that in Oregon, and people are like, B-movies, I don't even know what that is. So, um, but, you know, I, I just had a broken picker, and um, what ultimately happened is that Chris came down to Southern California, and we had stayed in contact, and we um, met up down in Laguna Hills, I had a friend down there, and we just took a drive on the beach, and he said, you know what, Barb, you deserve to be happy. And, and it had never really occurred to me that I was truly miserable. And what was happening is that every once in a while when I really tied one on, I wasn't even getting buzzed. I was getting no relief, nothing. And, and, and it scared me, and yet I still didn't realize that alcohol was my best, best friend. So, um, Chris was up in Oregon, I moved to Oregon because the problem is Southern California. <laughs> and I went back to Oregon and I moved in with Chris and he said, if you, uh, I said, I won't drink if I live, you know, with you, I won't drink. We got engaged and uh, within a short period of time, the cops had been called on us. I was completely and utterly insane. I was more uncomfortable than I'd ever been in my entire life. And he asked me, if you were to drink, what would you do? And I said, oh, I'd go down to Santa Fe at the bar and have a double shot corporal of gold with a beer back and head over to the Mission Theater that serves alcohol. And I'd get a couple of pitchers of beer and we'd go from there. I couldn't even find the grocery store, but I knew that. And he said, what would your mom do? My mom's not an alcoholic. She'd have a grasshopper. She'd drink half of it and let the rest evaporate. She makes me crazy. 
what would your dad do? My dad says he's alcoholic. My dad would go down, have a double shot, a gold with a beer back. And I stopped short and I said, oh my God, am I alcoholic? And he said, you're going to have to decide that for yourself. And I went to my first AA meeting the next day. I am an alcoholic. Um, the people in that meeting talked about alcoholism. They identified themselves as alcoholics. Saved my life. Um, if anything else had been discussed, I swear to you, I would have turned the other way and never come back. Um, because I'm an alcoholic and I need to have identification. I, I deeply believe I'm different than and apart from. So if I don't have that connection, that's it. I'm gone. Um, so I've been sober almost 15 years. My life has just um, been amazing. I've been married almost 15 years to the same man. And, um, and I like him. We drove all the way from Oregon, Portland. <laughs> And no bruises. <laughs> um, you know, um, I've, I've raised two dogs, and I don't have any children, and I have the best life that you know, I could possibly imagine. For those of you that are new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You have found your home if you're drunk like me. Thanks. This is a speaker workshop meeting. Our main speaker will share with us, and then there will be a 10-minute period for questions and answers. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Would you please join me in welcoming Chris C. from Portland. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Chris. My sobriety date is February 5th, 1987, and my home group is the West Portland Group. Thanks, Chuck, for asking me to come talk. And um, that part my wife talked about where she said the cops were called on us and she, cops were called on her. <laughs> I was sober. I mean, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, welcome to all the new people. And, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody will get anything out of anything I have to say, but I know that when I come and I share my experience with the idea that it may benefit somebody else, I get something from it. It enlarges my spiritual life, so I'm grateful for that opportunity. A uh, little bit of what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, my drinking career was only 11 years long, and for whatever reason, it progressed very rapidly. Uh, in those 11 years, um, just to kind of sum up my drinking, I was arrested 15 or 16 different times for alcohol-related arrests. Uh, I had three DUIs, went to two treatment centers. I was somebody that became a daily oblivion drinker. I drank to unconsciousness and blackout on a daily basis the last couple of years somebody that uh, lost control of my bodily functions and went to bed on a fairly normal basis. And, uh, and I, in the last year and a half, I, would, you know, I was pretty much just living to drink. And, um, and just to give you an idea where my head can still go sometimes today, I was speaking a few years ago at a meeting, and before I went into the meeting, I was thinking how I was going to start my talk off, and I thought, well, I'll just kind of summarize some of the my drinking low points or high points, um, high points in AA, low points before we got here. Uh, and uh, so I was kind of going through my head, okay, 15, 16 arrests, uh, three DUIs, I used to get alcohol withdrawal at the shakes, I'd have auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations when I'd come off of alcohol, uh, detox, hospitalized for alcohol withdrawal. And I was going through the thing and then all of a sudden my head goes, maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. <laughs> And uh, I recoiled from that thought as if from a hot flame. Uh, however, i got to tell you that those are the type of thoughts that at one time used to get me drunk. Because I would have this insane idea that somehow I was different than you guys, and that I wasn't a real alcoholic, or I was a different version of an alcoholic, or that I was an alcoholic, but I would be able to control and enjoy my drinking. And I would just, you know, an insane thought like that would go right down until it... it it didn't seem insane at the time. It only seems insane in hindsight. But those things don't necessarily make me an alcoholic. Um, uh, they're a pretty good indication I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all my life when I wasn't drinking, I was somebody that felt different than and apart from. I felt alienated from everybody. I felt less than. I had a tremendous inferiority complex coupled with a superiority complex. Um, I had these feelings of impending insanity and impending doom. I was hypersensitive. You know, just a casual glance would send me reeling. <laughs> I was hyper self-conscious. I was and terrified of people. I was I was I was so terrified of people that if I was walking down a street, walking down the sidewalk and somebody was coming the other way, I would literally cross the street so I could 
so I wouldn't have to have eye contact with another human being. And if I did happen to stay on that side of the street, I would just look at the cement and walk by and hope they wouldn't say anything to me. <laughs> now, that was the way I reacted to life when I wasn't drinking. If I had 10 drinks in my system, however, it was a whole different, you know, ball game. I could talk to people. I could look them in the eyes. Those feelings of difference and less than and so forth went away mostly. I mean, not totally. Early in my drinking career, a lot of my drinking was just for relief. A certain amount of alcohol gave me relief from the, my underlying causes and conditions and that isn't that I had. And uh, I've heard people say in Alcoholics Anonymous that, um, that they believe that alcohol actually preserved their sanity. I'm one of those, I, I believe that alcohol preserved my sanity. Had I not had that medication to take on a regular basis, I think I just, you know, I would have exploded like a pressure cooker. Um, Later on in my drinking, it became the fuel, the solution, allowed me to go out and participate in life. And, and, you know, 10 drinks made me feel the way that I thought you guys, well, not you guys, but those people out there <laughs> felt normally. And the problem with that is, and the, and the truth is this, is if I could have maintained what those 10 drinks did for me, I never would have came to Alcoholics Anonymous. The problem is, is that I suffer from that phenomenon of craving and a loss of control. After I get a certain amount of alcohol in my system, I crave more, and I cannot, I can't stop feeding that craving. And I totally lose control. In the beginning, it was just occasionally I would get that, and then later on, it was pretty much on a daily basis, and I drank into oblivion. Um, early on in my drinking, I, I was a daily drinker my entire drinking career for the most part. Um, early in my drinking career, I was, uh, you know, I had ran away from home on numerous occasions. I'd get drunk, run away from home, feel uh, guilty, uh, remorseful, and, uh, you know, come back home. Um, I was uh, kicked out of high school as a result of drinking. Uh, I, wrecked, I wrecked my first car when I was 14 as a result of drinking. Um, I was given my first field sobriety test at the age of 16, um, you know, I drank a lot. And, uh, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was kicked out of uh, high school, I went to work in the woods logging uh, up in Oregon. I grew, I grew up in, uh, in Portland, and I was kind of a maybe upper middle class family. And I came from a, my dad came from a lumbering family. And uh, where most kids rebel against their parents in Portland, they were doing it by haircuts and tats and stuff like that. I just went into the industry that he ran from, and I became a logger. And um, I, I spent about two years working in the woods logging, and uh, I drank with some of the, you know, some true professional drinkers. And at the age of 18, I stood out as the lush. I stood out as the lush on the crew. I got our crew kicked out of taverns. I got, you know, I mean, um, and already I was starting to attempt to control my drinking. Uh, I, I, when I was about 16 was the first time I recognized the loss of control. I had gone out um, to a kegger in high school. I went to a private high school, and we drank very similar to the way that people drink in college, and that is you know, we have kegs on Thursday night, Friday afternoon, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon, or Sunday morning. And um, I went out uh, this one time, and most of, my, most of the time my drinking it was intentional to drink to intoxication. This time, however, I had something that I wanted to do the following day. So I planned, okay, I'm, I'm only going to drink maybe six or seven cups, keg cups of beer at this kegger, because I need to get up tomorrow morning and do whatever it was I was going to do. And... Uh, I ended up going to this keg, I went into a blackout, and the next thing I know, I came to the next morning, I had no recollection of driving home or anything like that, and I thought, you know, that's interesting, because I had no intention of this happening, <laughs> and I had that, this kind of fleeting thought that there's something really wrong with this, and that just became, that became the norm for me. Um, I also, uh, very early on in my drinking, realized I, I was somebody that had, my emotions were just totally out of control. I mean, I just... I mean, I, I lived with like this lump of emotion in my throat. It just burned, you know, and, it, you know, if somebody did something to me or, you know, I fancied that somebody did something to me, and, you know, I just would live with this emotion. And I learned right away that a certain amount of alcohol, when I would drink that alcohol, it would just simmer those emotions and take me back to being even, you know. I just, I was so tightly wound, I, you know, I just felt at all times like I was about ready to break. And then I'd drink, and I could just breathe. 
and then I was okay. Uh, anyway, in the logging business, my, not only did my uh, disease of alcoholism in terms of the drinking progress, but the ism progressed as well. And uh, I became a worse drinker, but I also became more insane. I had the despair and the loneliness. Um, I heard somebody once say that they almost died of loneliness. And man, that, I really identify with that. I was somebody that almost identified with loneliness, or I almost died of, uh, with loneliness. Uh, during that time period, um, I remember I, I drove this truck for this logging company, and um, uh, it had the big truck mirrors on the side, and I couldn't look at myself in the mirror without getting teary-eyed. I mean, I would just, I was in so much pain and despair when I wasn't intoxicated. Um, in the fast-forwarding, in the fall of 1985, um, I had a conversation with myself, and I determined that uh, I determined that I couldn't sink any lower than I'd already sunk. This is several years several years uh, forward, and um, I decided that I'm no longer going to try to control my drinking. I've been battling this. You know, I, I did a 30-day stint without drinking. I did all sorts of plans and so forth to not drink and would end up drinking, and I just gave up the control. And so I gave up the control, and I went. For the next, the following three weeks after making that decision, I blacked out every day. And I drank to, to black out every day. And at the end of three weeks, I thought to myself, my God, am I going to ever be able to stop this? But it was, re- second thought was immediately was, I don't care. This is the happiest I've ever been. No job, no responsibilities, and daily oblivion drinker, drinking. I've heard that alcoholism is the only fatal progressive disease that has a fun phase. And this was... <laughs> And that was my fun phase. Um, and it lasted for about two months. And uh, in that two months, because prior to that, my drinking was primarily just, it was relief drinking. It was despair drinking. And during this period, I actually was, uh, I was able to engage. I was a bar drinker, and uh, I was in, in a bar where the type of drinking I did uh, was acceptable, and all sorts of weird behavior was acceptable, and I was engaging in some pretty weird behavior, too. And... Um, <clears throat> And at the end of those two months, uh, once again, I started trying to control and enjoy my drinking or stopping altogether. And I went through a series of, uh, of different things. You know, I tried eating certain foods. I tried drinking glasses of water in between drinks. The only thing that that ever did is I wet the bed earlier in the night. <laughs> you know, um, but I tried everything, and I gave, I gave it my all. I mean, I gave everything I could to not drink. And would drink, and it was on a daily basis. I would come to full of guilt, remorse, shame, which was the way I had been living for a long time, uh, regardless of what happened the night before, whether I had done some sort of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralizing thing, or whether it was just a, a night of drinking. I still suffered with this guilt and shame every morning. I would uh, piece the night together, piece the blackout the best I could uh, together, and I would swear off, and I would have. I would have, like, somewhere after swearing off, uh, if several hours later, I'd start to feel a little bit better. I'd get through the shakes, get through the sweats, all that. And so a light bulb would go off in my head and say, if I only drink some way, you know, this way tonight, and I would have some strategy in where I was going to drink, and it would make total sense, and I would drink again. And I did that day in and day out. In uh, June of 1986, <laughs> I... Uh, I went out and uh, and did do a pitiful and incomprehensible demoralizing thing, and I came to the next morning with one of those ones, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I was living in a town called Ashland, Oregon. Um, I got out on the, uh, on the freeway. I knew I needed to stop drinking. I was afraid of the DTs by this time, so my plan was is I was going to you know, go through the withdrawal process of, from alcohol and wean myself off of alcohol. I got out on the freeway, hitchhiked up to Portland, that first night up in Portland, I think I drank five or six beers. The second night, I drank like two or three beers. And then the last night, or the third or fourth night, I can't remember how it went, but um, I didn't drink anything. And, uh, and I came apart. I started getting the, the shakes. I had the anxiety. I was having anxiety attacks over and over again. My head would not stop. I was racing. And uh, I had had a visual, a visual hallucination the night before, um, which really scared me or really, or I might have been, I may not have had, the truth is, is I may not have had that visual hallucination. I was so concerned about having hallucinations, I may have dreamt that I had that hallucination. I'm not sure. I mean, I was so out of it. I definitely had the auditory hallucinations. I was somebody that when I would come off of alcohol after a day or two, I would get this like weird organ music playing behind me, and then I'd hear this crisp, 
I turn around and nobody would be there. And I do that several times before I realized. And I, I actually, I literally thought that everybody that had a hangover had auditory hallucinations. I had no idea that was part of alcohol withdrawal. Anyway, I checked into a detox. And um, so I weaned myself off of alcohol for three or four days. I went into this detox. They filled me full of Librium, kept me in there for five days, and uh, monitored my blood pressure around the clock. While I was in there the five days, there was these guys coming in that were, you know, old men, you know, and uh, they were seeing snakes. They truly were having visual hallucinations, seeing snakes come out of the wall and so forth. And they were ejected into the treatment center after three days, and I'm still there after four or five days. And I suddenly realized what, these, what this treatment center was doing. They were holding me in the detox longer to try to convince me that I'm really worse than I really am. And so I developed that there's this conspiracy to keep me in this uh, treatment center. So, anyway, I had a physical um, from the staff physician who said I had this, you know, I had liver problems and that uh, if I didn't, you know, if I didn't stop drinking, I probably, I probably wouldn't, I'd have full-blown cirrhosis within the next five years, most likely, definitely within the next ten. I, again, thought this was like the treatment center closer. You know, who was, you know, just trying to, you know, here, sign here for our 30 day program. And um, I did stay for the program. I went through the treatment. I was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous at that time. However, I, you know, whether I had selective hearing or whether it was the meetings that lacked a primary purpose that I was going to, I did not identify with uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Came out of that treatment center, and within a couple weeks, I was drinking again. Um, soon after that, I did a geographic up to Alaska. I went up to a dry logging camp up uh, about an hour and a half float plane ride from Ketchikan and <clears throat> um, got up there. I worked for three weeks and had no alcohol, didn't have any problems. I worked six days a week, rested on Sunday, worked six days. There was nowhere to go. I mean, it was an hour and a half float plane ride from anywhere and from the nearest tavern or bar or liquor store until these guys showed up with a bottle of liquor. And, uh, <laughs> and they, these guys, they showed up and they said, you want a drink? And my head, my head very quickly calculated, well, it's been three weeks. I haven't had DTs. I haven't had an I haven't even had a craving. Da, 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 da. I must not be an alcoholic. Sure. And so I took the bottle and I tipped the bottle up and I went, dunk, dunk, dunk. And they grabbed the bottle from me and they said, hey, we've got to make this last. I thought we were going to sit there and drink the bottle. Now, the problem is, is that I suffer from that phenomenon of craving, and I had probably the equivalent of about three or four shots of whiskey in me and no liquor. So I sat there that night with like an itch that I could not scratch. I mean, I was just coming unglued. So the next morning, I uh, caught a float plane into catch can. <laughs> and... Uh, I, uh, there's a bar in Ketchikan called the Folksel. And the Folksel is like this notorious drinking bar. It's where all the loggers and the fishermen meet and they knife each other and fight and all this. <laughs> and, but just to give you an idea of what kind of bar it is, when you go in and you order, say if you order Jim Beams, they give you the bottle of Jim Beams with a glass on top. And uh, that's the way they serve. <laughs> so I went in there with this guy named Dan, <clears throat> this guy from camp. Uh, his name was Dan and... Um, we sat down, and he must have had, uh, he must have been on his fourth drink or something, I don't know. But all of a sudden, he turned to me and said, so you think you're pretty badass, don't you? And, <laughs> and the night just erupted from there. And I ended up in jail in Ketchikan that night, and um, I was kind of a cop fighter also. I, uh, I wasn't, uh, which, I don't have time to talk about that. But I, I went in, I was thrown in this jail, and... Um, uh, just to give you an idea of how pitiful I am, my wife hates when I tell this story, <laughs> but, uh, just to give you how my mind operated. I was fighting with the cops all the way. They beat me up pretty bad by the time I got to the police station and or the jail, and um, I was still fighting with them within the jail, and they threw me into a holding cell with two other guys. And because I was fighting, they, just, they had strip searched me, and they threw me into the holding cell naked and then threw my orange jumpsuit in after me. And I, I thought as I was going through the door, okay, I'm walking into a holding cell in Ketchikan, Alaska, where women are scarce in the first place, and I'm in jail. I better do something to 
you know, ward off any advances. And, uh, <laughs> and so I walked over naked and punched the wall uh, in the cell and then dropped to the ground and did about 25 push-ups, then put on my orange jumpsuit, <laughs> thinking in my mind that this, that, that throughout the jail, this rumor was going to spread. <laughs> That, uh, you know, God, you got to watch out for that guy, you know. <laughs> you know, he's some sort of badass, you know. But the truth was, I was just pathetic. When I woke up, the guys were like, God, what were you on last night? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, when I came to in the morning, the guy on the top bunk was hanging over looking at me, and he said, uh, uh, he goes, hi, my name's so-and-so. He goes, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got 30 days sober, and I'm in here. My sponsor made me come in here and do some amends. I owe 10 days of jail time because I tried to commit suicide. And I remember looking at him. He was, he was hanging from the top bunk, looking at him. I thought, my God, I can't even get away from AA in here. Uh, anyway, I... Uh, when I left Ketchikan, uh, I was released after I went to court and so forth, and um, when I left Ketchikan, I never once did I think I have a drinking problem. My, as the plane was taken off Ketchikan, I thought to myself, I will never come to Alaska again. <laughs> you know, it was always some, something or somewhere else, you know, but it had nothing to do with me. Anyway, I ended up uh, back down in southern Oregon, and a town called Ashland's right on the border of uh, California and Oregon. I owed... Uh, I owed eight days of jail time for my third DUI. I did the jail time on uh, weekends. Uh, starting in January of 1987, I'd go in on Friday nights, come out on Sunday, spend the weekdays doing what I, well, I was supposed to be doing something besides uh, what I was doing, but, uh, and I'd come back in and I'd spend the weekends. Between the third and fourth weekend on a Wednesday, I managed to get arrested uh, in between my stints in jail. <clears throat> and the Ashland Police Department knew me uh, on a fairly regular basis by now. I mean, I'd been, in my last 12 months of drinking, I was arrested nine times for uh, alcohol-related uh, deals, uh, with the exception of um, one arrest I did have that had not a lot to do with alcohol. I, was, I had a warrant out for my arrest, and somebody had stole my car, and I called it in, uh, stolen, and they came and arrested me, and they said, you can either spend the day in jail or get your fourth DUI. Um, but anyway, I'd been arrested nine times, and the police took me aside, and they said, you know, Chris, you've got a hell of a drinking problem. You've got to do something about this. You know, go see this guy, Joe Fisher. He's an expert on alcoholism, and, you know, he can help you out. And I, you know, was like, yeah, 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 you know, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll go see this guy, Joe. The following day, or, yeah, it was the following day, because it was Thursday, um, I was walking down the street, and in Ashland, there was one of these sidewalk preachers that would stand there and read scripture to anybody that would come by. And um, I was coming by, and he read something out of the Bible, and I kept walking, and then it, it suddenly dawned on me, and I had no idea what it was, what it read, but somehow it clicked, and I thought, it, was, it seemed to be related to the police telling me to go see this guy, Joe Fisher. And I thought, now, if I was one of those AA people, and there are no coincidences, uh, I would think that this is God, and, you know, some sort of fate, and I should actually act on that. And I took a few more steps, and I thought to myself, what would happen if for once in my life, I didn't dismiss something like this as being trivial and stupid, and actually did act on it? And almost out of my own amusement, I acted on it. And I remember kind of smiling to myself as I was going to walking towards Joe Fisher's office. And um, I went into Joe Fisher's office. He initially wouldn't see me um, because he knew who I was. And, uh, <laughs> and when his secretary said, what do you want? And I said, I want help with my drinking problem. And I really did. I desperately wanted to quit drinking. And um, as she was going to get him, uh, I remember thinking, please be aversion therapy. Please be 10 days and a couple two-day follow-ups. <laughs> And now you, you have five years and your life's wonderful, but not Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and sure enough, Joe took me into his office, and he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he told me his story, and at the end of telling me his story, he invited me to a meeting. And out of a sense of obligation, since I did ask him to help, for help, I went to the meeting. I did not want to go. I'd already had exposure um, to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I just didn't have any interest in going, but I went sat in the back of the room, and, uh, 
And at this meeting, it was a uh, speaker discussion meeting, and uh, when there was somebody that was new at the meeting, what they would do is they, generally they'd have a, it was a topic, and they'd talk about a topic, and then they'd call on people, and, but when there was somebody new, they would make the topic a little bit of what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. The speaker talked for about 20 minutes, shared their story, and then started calling on people, and little by little, I started identifying. I drank like that. I drank like that. I thought like that. I felt like that. And there was one guy a couple rows in front of me, and um, he stood up and uh, he talked about coming out of a blackout with a revolver in his mouth and then going back into the blackout and coming to the next morning with the revolver on the floor next to him. And I had almost the exact experience. I mean, it gave me goosebumps. I came out of a blackout, and I was holding a carving knife to myself, and I'd gone back into the blackout, and I came to later you know, with the, in a chair with a carving knife next to me. The only difference is, is I had uh, stepped a bit the furniture throughout the house. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I came away from that meeting with a sense of hope because I'd identified here were some people that drank the way I drank, they thought the way I thought, and they felt the way I felt, and they weren't drinking. And the next day I didn't take a drink. And, um, which was remarkable because the way I drank. And, um, but I didn't keep coming back, so I ultimately drank again. And I drank for, I think, about a week more. And on February 4th, 1987, I went out one more time to prove that I could drink or can control my alcoholism. And my plan was, as I was going to go out, drink 10 drinks, cut it off, and at 10 or 11 o'clock that night, I would come home, go to bed, get up the next morning, and be like a regular civilian. The guy that was supposed to come pick me up to take me to the bars was late. I drank nine beers in my living room waiting for him before we headed to the bars. So I already kind of blew my limit before we even headed down to the bars. Went down to the bars. Uh, I remember I had one hand over one eye. I was drinking vodka Collins. And uh, in one bar, I went to another bar, which was my drinking uh, hole. And... Um, sat down and was drinking there. I was in and out of the blackout, but I remember having a, bar, a conversation with the bartender. His name was Cliff. And um, I had one of those light bulbs go off in my head, and I thought, if only I was a bartender, then I wouldn't have the problems. That way I could work, drink, get up, work, drink, and just live in a bar. And, uh, and I was a shoe in for the job. Cliff assured me that I had the job, but a little bit later he cut me off from drinking, which they never cut anybody off in this bar. So I grabbed Cliff and pulled him across the bar and was going to work him over on the bar, and uh, he kind of weaseled away from me and ran into the refrigerator and locked himself in there and called the police. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I took off running through backyards, which was something that I was accustomed to doing, and um, <laughs> running through backyards and the police chasing me, and finally the police caught me. and, and uh, and they ended up catching me, and I don't know what happened because that night was not really that big of a deal compared to a lot of the stuff that I've been through. But something happened inside me. Something changed. I couldn't do this anymore. And um, they took me in. They arrested me. They uh, you know, booked me, and then they took me home that night. I went to bed, and my last conscious thought before I passed out was, I wonder if I'll feel this way in the morning. And I did. When I came to, I was at a bottom. I... I, death was a more attractive alternative than continue living the way I was living at that point. Had I had a crystal ball that morning that said, if you just drink for another 90 days or another six months, you'll be dead, I would have drank until I died. My fear was, is that I was going to continue to live for another year or two, and I was going to spiral down this miserable existence of a life that I had created further and further and have to endure this for another one or two or five or ten years. And uh, I cried out to a God that I did not want to believe in, and I said, God, please make this stop or kill me. And um, that was February 5th of 1987, and I became willing to do what they had said in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because of that Clay Street meeting where I'd been the week prior, where they had talked about alcoholism that I identified with and were not drinking, I knew that there was a place to go. And so I checked into Alcoholics Anonymous, and... Uh, and I started doing the things that they told me to do. They said, go to 90 meeting, my meetings in 90 days, get a big book, and uh, start working the steps, get a sponsor, and I started doing that. Um, and uh, all was well for about 44 days, and uh, <laughs> at the end of 44 days, I had an anxiety attack, which I had never had before. I ended up in the hospital, 
And uh, I had done the first three steps, by the way, and I kind of missed that place in the book where it says that although this was a vital and crucial step, it'll have little permanent effect unless it once followed by this next step, the fourth step. And um, so anyway, I started going crazy in sobriety. And um, I don't have a, I'm kind of running out of time, but uh, I'll just tell you that uh, the, um, what finally happened is about nine months of sobriety, I hit another bottom in sobriety. And I surrendered again. And I came to the conclusion that uh, I'm going to work steps four through 12 exactly as they're outlined in the big book with my sponsor, like he had been urging me to do and the other members of the group had been doing. And if I get to step 12 and I still feel the way that I am, then I'm going to commit suicide. So I started in on my four step. <clears throat> and I wrote a very thorough four step and um, got together with my sponsor to do my fifth step, did my fifth step. Halfway through my fifth step, um, I went into the restroom to take, we, we took a break, and I went into the restroom. And one of the things that I had always done is I'd always go to the mirror and I would judge myself. And I'd, it either, and it would come from somewhere in my soul. And I would either say, i build myself up, you know, I'm great, I'm this, I'm that, and da, 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 da. And that'd last for about two minutes. It was fleeting. Then I'd go right back to being a loser. Generally, it was I would tear myself down. I would look in the mirror and I'd go, this is what's wrong with me, this is what's wrong with me. You know, God, what's wrong with me? And it would come, it would come from the soul. Anyway, I, halfway through this fifth step, as I was looking in the mirror, I was looking and I didn't get that reaction. And I started, I was like, what is this? What is this that I'm sensing? What is this I'm feeling? And I realized that what it was, was comfort. And it was the first time that I'd ever experienced comfort in my own skin without a certain amount of alcohol in my system. And I went from there, um, my, did my fifth step. I did step six and seven. And uh, several weeks after doing six and seven, my entire world had changed. Nothing had changed, but everything had changed, as they say. It just was, was as if a shift had happened internally within me. And I started having some peace in my life. I start, the fear and anxiety started dissipating. The, uh, the hate and resentment towards everybody on the earth started going away. <laughs> the self-consciousness started drifting a little bit. The self-pity, the self-pity was, uh, a ton of the self-pity was removed. A lot of my character defects, you know, a lot of them were removed. Some of them just enough of the power was taken away from them to where I could go out and function comfortably in, in life. And I went into, into steps eight and nine and, and uh, got the benefits from there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I am... I am sober from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous today, and uh, I am I'm not somebody that I didn't, I didn't like AA when I came here. I didn't like God. I didn't like, you know, you people. Uh, <laughs> um, I, didn't like, uh, I didn't like anything about it, but I knew it worked, and I started doing it because I saw it working, and I just hoped that it would work for me, and I found that it did work for me. And, uh, you know, I live a life today that is... Uh, you know, you know, I could have never imagined living. And uh, I wish I would have taken a little more time to talk about some of that stuff, but uh, through a set of circumstances and, you know, curious circumstances and coincidences, I met my wife and was married to the woman I always wanted to marry. I, uh, through uh, intuitive thoughts and through prayer and meditation, I ended up uh, getting a job, uh, and the type of job that somebody like me doesn't get. And then I ended up through uh, practicing the principles of um, I had heard Chuck Chamberlain say, you know, wiping out a record and practicing that in my in in this job that I ended up not liking. I ended up owning 50% of a business in that industry and have grown that in that industry. Um, so, uh, you know, I am my everything in my life today is a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, as a, as a design for living, when I put this thing first. And I really live this thing. Um, you know, most of the time my life goes pretty good. Most of the time I'm reasonably comfortable in my own skin. My reaction to life circumstances, because life still happens, is significantly different than the way they than it, than it once was. And uh, you know, there's only been two things that have ever worked in my life, and that was ten drinks, and they gave me a certain amount of comfort and ability to go out and participate in life, and taking a whole bunch of God-centered and other-centered action 
And that has given me peace and comfort and allowed me to go out and participate in life. And I can't live in between because in between, if I can't, if I'm not drinking and I'm not doing and living this thing, my life is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, in, I'm nuts and, uh, and uncomfortable. So, uh, I'm very grateful to have been asked to do this and, uh, grateful to be sober today. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.